All right, folks, it's a couple minutes after, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just want to say thank you so much for joining us, you know, in this morning. Uh, my name is Emma Kinema. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm a campaign lead for the Communications Workers of America, working on the Code CWA initiative to organize in the tech, game development, and digital media industries. This session that you're at is Game Changer, Tech Workers Organizing for Justice. And in the session, you'll hear, hear directly from three different workers, each with their own unique labor organizing experience from three very different areas of the tech industry. This will be a two-part Q&A panel. And the first part will be moderated by me and the panelists having a discussion. And towards the end, we'll open it up to audience questions. So throughout the panel, please do take some time to think of questions you'd like to ask them based off their experience and submit them anytime during the panel so we can see them and answer them. All right, with that said, let's jump into it. Um, let's do a round of introductions from the panelists and would each of you maybe mind introducing yourself with your name, pronouns, job, and kind of your organizing context. Parl, do you wanna maybe start? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Parul. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a software engineer. Um, I work out of New York City, and I work at Google. Great. Thank you. Sherry? <laughs> You're muted, Sherry. Thank you for that. Good morning, everyone. At least good morning for our uh, West Coast folks and good afternoon to my East Coasters. My name is Sherry Murphy. I go by she or her. I'm a social justice minister here in Oakland, California. And I'm also a lead organizer for Cape Workers Rising. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sherry. And Devin? Hi, my name is Devin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a member of VOW, the Voltage Organized Workers, which is a group of contract workers who recently organized with the help of Code CWA. Awesome. And thank you, all three of you, for being a part of this. Um, so I think maybe we can just dive into a little bit of, you know, what is your experience with organizing? You know, what context you come out of and what the nature of your organizing really kind of looks like? Maybe we can go in reverse order, starting with Devin. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, what's your experience with organizing? You know, uh, what kind of brings you to organizing and, and how has it been for you? Um, so VOW kind of came together to fight for fairer working and pay conditions. Um, we're very concerned about contractor rights. Um, and so we organized to, to try and get that accomplished. Gotcha. Thanks. And do you want to maybe explain um, your company and kind of the nature of your work and um, a little bit more about your strike that you recently had? Yes. So we are all contract writers for a company called Voltage um, that puts out visual novels, um, romances primarily aimed at queer readers and women. And the studio, um, particularly the contact writing team, um, makes up you know, we're all made up of those demographics as well. So we all applied to this job um, because we really loved the stories and wanted to, we felt that was very important, um, but the pay was less than half of the industry standard. So we all came together to um, try and get that raised up. So we went on strike for about three weeks and ended up um, reaching a successful resolution last week. Yeah, and getting quite a, a huge amount of support from fans and folks in the industry. Um, Sherry, do you want to kind of set the context of your organizing experience and what you're up to? Uh, so I, what brought me into organizing? So it was around about after the 2008 Wall Street crash, the global economy, um, African Americans lost under $200 billion in wealth. And this was one of the greatest destructions of black wealth since the burning of Black Wall Street in 1921. Um, and during that time, during between 2008 and 2012, over 900, 9 million homes were foreclosed um, by some banks who crashed the economy. Um, and families are still recovering. And um, I'm one of those. I lost a home. Um, I lost a job three months after arriving in Oakland. 
Um, I had grown up to believe that if I did the right thing, um, things would come to me, um, but began to assess my beliefs around success and worthiness and begin to look more closely at the intersections of uh, race, um, gender, class, and sexual um, orientation. Um, which is why I know um, that um, as a, a Black queer woman, um, labor protections um, and benefits are vital. Um, here in Oakland, um, in 1980, uh, Oakland's, Black Oakland's population consisted of over 47% of African Americans, and today that number is over 28%. Um, so not only has my organizing been around um, housing, but more currently it's around economics. And um, so currently I work for um, gig workers um, rising. Um, and it is around uh, where I find myself um, um, around this pandemic in um, Black Lives Matter is, you know, always questioning why people who are the minority of a situation are frequently the center of agitation. Um, the shelter in place, all of us depend on frontline and central workers, yet um, frontline and central workers are the, among the hardest hit economically. I mean, for the past few years, I've been driving for Lyft and have been, um, that has been my source of income and I've given over 12,000 rides. And, um, at the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, gig workers were faced with a devil's choice to continue working despite a highly contagious disease that has the potential to kill us or try to secure our housing or our, our bills. Um, and for those you know, economic justice is racial justice, that the same conditions that promote the killings and exploitations um, by police brutality are the same conditions that provoke and kill um, workers. Um, I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> that could go yeah. on. Thank you, Sherry. And and we'll get much more into the, the kind of detail of it too. Paro, you know, on the flip side, you know, you're a full-time employee for a major tech company, you know, the kind of the opposite end experience of Sherry. Can you articulate a, a little bit about your context of organizing and you know what that's been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you for you know sharing your stories, Devin and Sherry. Um, so I'm Paro. I work as a software engineer at Google. Um, I've been working at Google for almost about a year, so I'm still relatively new. And my organizing background is really from student organizing. Um, I was involved in um, anti-war organizing and LGBTQ organizing while I was in university. Um, I happen to know people who were connected to the walkout, the women's walkout struggle at Google. And then that's how I got involved with organizing when I joined there. Um, I think Google is a, you know, really interesting and very different context because it's a whole other, I guess, type of organizing. People often organizing for issues that um, don't necessarily affect them, but are related to issues out there in the world, like um, influencing the company's policy on um, engaging with, uh, you know, the military and companies that are producing and manufacturing for war. Um, or uh, you know, paying executives uh, millions of dollars in, uh, in 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 like severance packages when they leave the company after harassing women. Um, so there's a rich history of organizing at Google, and I was sort of like brought into it um, from that lens. Um, and uh, you know, if if folks have been following that history of uh, organizing at Google in the news recently, um, there were some really prominent firings of uh, primarily LGBTQ workers early last year. And um, um, more recently, there's been organizing within the company questioning its relationship to uh, police departments and the way Google is involved with um, organizations that are propping up mass incarceration in the US. Um, obviously, all of this is racialized. Um, Google's workforce itself is racialized. Um, you know, I mean, I would love to talk about this later, but um, there's a two sort of tier system at Google where there's full-time employees like myself and then a category of workers called temps vendors and contractors who you know, work for the company but are typically um, technically employed by other companies. And um, their working conditions and uh, benefits are all of a very, very na different nature and are typically uh, much lower than what full-time employees get. Um, and that workforce is incredibly racialized. Um, so in my office in New York City, for example, you know, I'm sure people know New York is one of the most diverse cities in the world, 
Um, but you walk into a Google office and you'll find that the full-time staff is predominantly white um, and already sort of from an upper class background. And then folks who work um, as kitchen staff or as custodial staff or, you know, TVCs and technical roles are typically racialized workers. So um, there's a lot of organizing around racism in that context. Yeah, thank you, Parul. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear you talk more about that kind of two-tier division you're talking about at Google. Um, it's unfortunately really common at all the major tech companies. Um, you know, I think I would really like to, you know, I know you all kind of touched on it in your different ways, but maybe um, it'd be nice to hear you go a little bit more in depth in terms of what specifically personally brought you into organizing or how do you relate to the concept of organizing? Do you think of yourself as an organizer? Do you think of someone who's just simply engaging with your community in a meaningful way? Um, yeah, maybe if we could hear your thoughts on that and maybe starting with Devin, like how do you approach that subject? Sure. Um, when I originally became a part of VOW, I had no organizing experience. I didn't know anyone who was involved in organizing, um, but just from from talking to the other writers and hearing about their conditions um i think many of us had the realization that when we were only thinking about ourselves we could tell ourselves oh it wasn't so bad or oh, maybe i'm not good enough to deserve you know the basic standard of pay um but once it was my friends and my coworkers and my peers that i was speaking to you know that was the wake-up call of like this is unacceptable there's 21 people here who who aren't being respected in the workplace. So now I think um, I went from knowing nothing to very much considering myself an organizer um, because we realized that these problems aren't specific to our company. These are very ingrained in our society and our institutions. And this is going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort to change. So I think we're all pretty committed to sticking with that. Yeah, thanks, Devin. And um, Sherry, how about yourself? Um, will you repeat the question for me again? I want to make sure I, I address it. Totally. Um, yeah, I'm kind of wanting to hear a little bit more in depth on what personally brings you to organizing and also how do you conceive of yourself as an organizer or someone who's just working in the community or, you know, how does that, you know, how do you relate to organizing, I guess, on a personal level? Um, it's really, and, and I'm having problems because it's really a lifestyle for me. Um, and even if, if I took away my spirituality, it's always for me, um, strive to, um, which is one of the contentions for me, um, always in a position of, um, striving to affirm and fighting, affirm my dignity and respect, either in, in the area of race or gender, um, or class or, um, on sexual orientation, um, that um, organizing for me is an eternal lifestyle, constantly from the moment that I wake up to the moment that um, I walk out of that front door. It happens to be within the context of uh, big um, affirming gay workers' rights um, in the areas of um, economics because those delivery drivers, those grocery workers, delivery people, right share drivers like me are predominantly African American, indigenous, brown people of color who are on the front lines every day providing services um, and among the hardest hit economically. One of the things that I noticed for me, as I said earlier, as a black queer woman, um, that there were no protections in place for us, no protections as relates to when I'm talking about regular PPE equipment. Um, um, a resource to go to the restroom, um, hand sanitizers, face mask. And so there were no protections or no protocol about um, sanitizing measures. In, because Lyft and Uber were nowhere to be found. Um, and um, what you will find, or at least in my experience, is that corporations like Lyft and Uber are filled with hollow words about um, being about black and brown lives, but not really showing up. Um, so my, my life is around um, calling people out who buy, um, cheat and steal, um, or exploit um, black and brown bodies. Um, and, and to me, we call it organizing, but it's a lifestyle for me. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Sherry. Thank you. 
Um, Paro, how about yourself? Um, I really appreciated Sherry's answer, and I think mine is um, similar, although from an extremely different perspective. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, I've only really been working in the industry for about a year, but I sort of started organizing um, around 2016 after um, the Donald after Donald Trump became uh, the president of the U.S. Um, that sort of catapulted me into organizing, and I've been doing it. Um, you know, sort of consistently um, in the workplace and um, a lot outside of the workplace ever since then. Um, I think, um, you know, as much as I can speak for the last four years of my life, it certainly turned into um, a lifestyle of sorts. Um, and I think uh, the, the usefulness or the thing about that is um, knowing that, you know, coming out as a computer science graduate from university uh, and knowing what my options in the workplace were, um, it really felt like there was no, there was nowhere I could go where things would be perfect. There were always going to be, um, you know, difficult choices to be made about um, the companies that you decided to work at. If you, you know, worked at the, any of the major tech companies um, in the U.S. And um, realizing that, like, I could either sort of try to, you know, pigeonhole myself by trying to find the like perfect, most idealized workplace that was doing work that was completely like aligned with my values. Um, and I remember trying to do that as a student and realizing that it's actually really hard and there's actually not a lot of options. And most of us are sort of um, forced into situations where we really enjoy the nature of the work we're doing, but we don't necessarily align with um, what uh, our companies are doing or the ways in which they're influencing the rest of the world or even the kinds of like disparity around race and gender that you see in the workplace. Um, and so that's what's kind of influenced my organizing at Google, um, you know, coming in with all of the organizing experience I had from the past and knowing that things aren't going to be perfect and people have been doing this work here for almost 20 years and I'm sort of just continuing that history. Thank you, Parl. Um, you know, I think I always find it really interesting to hear more from people engaged in organizing about, you know, the personal aspects of it, kind of the more the day-to-day -day aspects. I think a lot of times, most people's relationship to what we call organizing, to Sherry's point, um, often seems, you know, kind of trapped behind things like, you know, major press moments or, you know, things that really trend on social media. And, and I think these kind of bigger, broader conversations sometimes obscure the interesting reality of the day-to-day -day organizing. Um, and so I think it'd be really nice to hear, you know, going for each of you, you know, really what is your day-to-day -day like within organizing for you? Like, what does it look like on a typical day? Um, Devin, do you want to maybe start us off? Sure. Um, for us, the day-to-day -day organizing is very much about checking in on each other as people. Um, I guess to, to touch on one of the Q&As about organizing in COVID, um, for Vow in particular, it hasn't been just about COVID, but also because we're all remote contractors. Um, we all live very far apart from each other. So this kind of remote organizing has, has been all we could do. Um, so, you know, we have group areas where we can text, we have uh, group calls and group video calls and just kind of trying to tailor to everyone's comfort level. Um, you know, some people don't like to use video. I personally will bug out on a voice only call. I need to see people's faces or their words, like no in between. Um, but it's mostly because the, the strength of an organization comes from its unity. And so if you don't do the groundwork there with, you know, building trust in the people in the organization, especially if you're a case like ours, where many of us didn't know each other before forming Bao, um, you know, you really need to like care about people and put in the work to know about their day-to-day -day lives, and especially in times like this with COVID going on, we have people who are working other jobs that are very impacted by this, people who have family who have contracted COVID, um, and, you know, they're, everyone's lives, even if organizing is a lifestyle, everyone's lives are a little broader than that, so we just try to support each other as best we can. Yeah, I... I really, you know, I feel like every single time I would hop on a call with y'all um, at Voltage, there was always a real emphasis on that personal connection and checking in with each other. And 
having that social connection that was maybe missing when everyone is working remotely. So that's an interesting kind of aspect of the organizing work, particularly during this time. Um, Sherry, how about yourself? So uh, for me, you know, I just um, agree with what she said. A lot of it, and the other thing to me that I found out is creativity. I understand that there has to be more than just one, one way of doing things. So I think that in the, in the times of COVID-19, allows you to be free and vision about um, asking yourself what it is that you want to accomplish and then allowing the, those things that we, that we believe have limited us, do that, actually do that. Um, it, it surrounds itself around relationship building. And it, it surrounds itself around centering those who have no voice, no benefits, no protections, and, and understanding that um, we, whatever we do together, what it's about. It's about centering um, whatever that we're working on. Um, and a lot of times um, it's not necessarily a glamorous or a high paying job. Um, you know, you're sitting on Zoom uh, one day for seven hours or you're texting or, or you're going out or there or you're being trolled um, or called names. Um, dismantling white supremacy doesn't give you a lot of air, you know, um, it's it's hard work, um, and a lot of times it's voluntarily. Um, but yeah, I do want to make sure that um, in the end, it's about um, relationship building. Um, there, may, there have been times when we've had a meeting that's probably consisted of an hour, and 40 minutes of that was getting to know um, each other about what's going on in that moment and taking that time. That in that those conversations, I believe will take an organization much further than just strategizing and taking the humanity um, out of that context. So yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sherry. And Parl, how about yourself? What's the day-to-day -day look like? Um, so I broadly, you know, I broadly agree with what Sherry and Devin have mentioned. It's a lot of relationship building. Um, the day-to-day -day just looks like being on Zoom all day for hours on end at times. Um, it's a lot of Zoom calls. It's a lot of um, just talking to people, getting to know um, their story and the conditions of their life more intimately, um, and really building, uh, building a connection from there. Um, I think like folks have mentioned, um, you can't really get anything done if the people that you're working with don't trust you. Um, or really believe that you have um, their best interests at heart. And so a lot of the work is just, um, you know, getting to know them, connecting with them, and then follow up. Um, follow up is incredibly important as well. Um, and yeah, that's, that's mostly what the day-to-day -day looks like. Um, and it's funny too, because I think when, uh, before COVID hit, I think, you know, being able to meet in person and organize things, um, was just so was just so much easier and so much better and when when this when the conditions that we're in right now sort of started to happen everyone was like oh i guess we're just not gonna organize anymore because we can't meet up um and yet here we are like five or six months in having done more than maybe what we had in the months prior just via zoom um so it's really hard but um it is possible and um it really takes intention and dedication to connecting with people under difficult circumstances. Yeah, thank you, Parl. And you just mentioned, it felt like maybe you've done even more during these circumstances when you're not actually able to meet in person. Can you maybe expand on like why you think that might be? I mean, I think the crux of it is just um, the world we live in right now. You know, I think like folks mentioned, like the coronavirus itself has been affecting um, people and their families and their lives in, in such an acute way and seeing the response that uh, the U.S. government has had and just the social situation, the social reality of the pandemic um, has obviously pushed people um, over, you know, a certain edge. And then obviously the other thing is the, the rebellion that we saw against racism and police brutality in the streets. Um, I mean, even under conditions of a pandemic, um, the, the violence and the brutality that people saw on the streets just encouraged us to keep keep going out and keep doing keep doing more and um you know i remember what we had a moment where we were like um 
we can't not do something right now, even if it's hard and even if it's challenging and we're not sure how we're going to able to, how we're going to pull this off. Like there's a, there's a movement in the streets right now and it has to be, um, it has to be like, we, we need to respond to it somehow in our own work. So I think that energy and that um, just that political moment is what has pushed us all into doing more than what we thought was possible. Yeah, thank you, Parl. I know on the many campaigns that I'm working on, that seems to be a similar trend, you know, at least for the groups that can kind of make that transition into the, the COVID era and their organizing. It, I feel like it's almost brought people a little bit closer together. It's kind of added extra, I don't know, almost like historical pressure <laughs> to like push people to really wanting to fight for each other. Um, I feel like COVID kind of provides a lot of obstacles, but also I think a lot of opportunities kind of on the flip side of it. So it's kind of interesting that you're mentioning that. Um, I, you know, both, I think all three of you actually really touched a bit on kind of relationships within organizing. Um, I'd really like to hear maybe a little bit more on kind of, you know, what is the like internal and culture building work that really needs to happen uh, in, in your mind for organizing to be really, really successful? Um, I'd love to just maybe hear a little bit more of that in terms of your particular experience and maybe some generalized uh, principles you'd provide people. Um, Devin, do you want to maybe get started? Yeah. Um, so one of the big ones for, for Val was building a culture of openness. Um, you know, we are all contractors. We organize with no protections at all. We could have legally been fired at any time for any reason. And it, you know, a lot of people were very afraid, even though they wanted to do what they felt was right. Um, and we, we've never wanted anyone to feel like they have to, or that they're ultimately doing something they don't want to do because it will impact them negatively. So we tried to kind of make an environment where it was okay any time of day to just come in and say like, you know, I'm very worried about this thing or, um, you know, here are these like TMI, very personal circumstances. You're not allowed to judge me. Um, or even just, you know, I woke up angry. I'm so angry and I want to talk about it. And to kind of have a space where that was always okay. And there were always going to be people online who could help talk you through it or even, you know, get on a voice or a video call with you um, so that you like weren't alone in it. Um, and to constantly validate and to reassure each other that everything you're feeling, even the negative feelings, it's all very normal and it's very part of the process. Um, we took inoculation very seriously, um, which for people listening is kind of the process of, you know, naming and facing your fears, getting used to them, almost like a, a dry run of, of facing what you're afraid of. And so when it really happens, you can keep a calmer head and you're not so afraid of it. Um, so that's something we do all the time is inoculate. Would you mind giving maybe an example of um, something in your recent strike where you all had discussed it, um, you know, as inoculation in, in terms of what you're talking about, and it paid off because it really helped kind of calm people down in the moment. Yes, this is actually, I'm having so many examples that I can't actually think one through clearly. <laughs> um, can you think of one? <laughs> sure, I mean, I, I think, you know, one in particular is, uh, I know folks were very worried about kind of any personal kind of, I guess, guilt driven responses from management after your demands were given to them um, for a reasonable living wage, which should not be a controversial thing to ask for, but um, all the same it was. And so I think prepping people to, to maybe understand that, um, you know, you might not get a very nice professional response from folks uh, in management. I think I, I at least I think it helped calm people to understand, like, you know, not to be caught off guard when management got a little nasty or kind of defaulted to some negative behavior. I think you know, ex but you know, it also helped I think keep y'all in a professional, positive, optimistic, professional kind of position throughout the strike, which I think was really really important to you. Yeah. I completely agree with that. We even went in and, and some of our members who are more experienced with organizing in history, um, you know, we're linking examples of, you know, both terrible things that corporations have done over the years, like, you know, turning on the fire hoses and, 
and like beating people in the streets, you know, and, and regular corporate things. And it kind of helped us because so many of our relationships in the workplace were positive and we really didn't want to make waves and cause fuss and problems for people, but um, we couldn't just sit with our problems quietly anymore. And um, it was useful to kind of see the history and to talk it all out together and um, almost depersonalize it in, in the understanding that any reaction we got would not be specific to voltage. It would not be personal. It's just how the corporations react. Right. Um, Sherry, I mean, I know you're in a big fight with some pretty nasty responses from, uh, you know, the corporations that you're taking on. Um, you know, I, I'd still love to hear from like, what kind of internal and culture building work have you been doing that is really, really essential? And, you know, how has that helped y'all in this major, major confrontation um, with the rideshare apps? Yeah, so, you know, uh, it's a really great question. And it's kind of hard to discern. Culture is a powerful thing, right? You know, you look at, depending upon whether or not you're in Oakland or you're San Francisco, you can see the vibes. Um, yet, can be hard to identify, and particularly hard to identify um, if you're uncomfortable around naming it, um, particularly in the area of race and racism. You know, for example, Prop 22 is a discriminatory, discriminatory and racist ballot initiative that goes directly to voters in November, um, who are not aware of the fact that Lyft and Uber are trying to buy, steal, and cheat their way out of their responsibility. There are a number of folks who millions of folks are still fighting for unemployment insurance because Lyft and Uber um, have refused um, to do their fair share, pay into their taxes. So how do you deal with that from a historical legacy around corporations that are more concerned with their profits than they're all more concerned with bodies, particularly those who are black and brown and indigenous? Um, and so what that looks like in your own infrastructure doing your own anti-racism work. You know, are you coming in on a day-to-day -day basis and um, just being business oriented? Or are, have we, as we talked earlier before, are we creating a culture of appreciation for each and every individual um, and celebrating our diversities? Um, are we, um, do we have a realistic work plan or is a realistic work plan around creating um, slave drivers and mimicking um, corporations like Lyft and Uber. So a lot of that really has, what is our decision making like? Um, are we centering black and brown people around Prop 22, uh, a ballot initiative that limits and weakens health and wage, wage protection? Are we centering the voices of those mostly impacted or are those at the table, um, those with the purse string? I, th I think it's really important really ask those questions and have it be fluid and have it be honest in a way that we avoid what we call polite conversations. Um, this work requires the ability to sit in some tense moments in order to get to the, to the promised land of equity and sustainability. Um, unless, we're cont unless we want to see the same things that we have been seeing. Um, I know for me, I don't. So it requires a certain kind of responsibility in a culture that talks about equity and sustainability um, that feels like the ability um, to expand our own individual personalities around comfort zones and the ability to get out of those comfort zones. That's the number one requirement, the ability to talk about race, but also do your anti-racism anti work. I'm gonna stop right there. I'm pretty sure I could listen to you talk about this all day, but I really appreciate that. Parul, do you have anything you'd wanna like expand on in terms of you know building up an internal kind of organizing culture and how that fosters good organizing? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I'm learning so much just from what the other panelists are saying. And I think some of what they are talking about holds true to my context as well. But I wanna highlight um, really, uh, encouraging worker solidarity. I think that was a big aspect of like how we approach this at Google. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of people kind of will say nice things and will kind of denounce like, oh, it's so bad that racism is happening, but it's like, it's not really um, 
my place or I don't know how to get involved in this work. Um, and I think encouraging solidarity during that time, the, like how necessary it is for people that aren't black or brown to be involved in the struggle and really fight for it as their own struggle um, is so important. Obviously with the caveat that, you know, the right voices are being centered at the same time as well. Um, but I think there's a balance there between, um, you know, making sure that it, everyone knows that we have to all like fight this fight as though it's our own. That's the only way we'll sort of reach the level of commitment necessary to actually win. Um, and then, and then there's the, you know, it's a sort of, I guess, related to Devin's point about inoculation. Um, a company like Google where, you know, at least with full-time staff, like so many of them are so well, so well paid. They have sort of reasonably uh, positive images of executives and leadership. It's sometimes hard to chip through the internal narrative that like the, the corporation will ultimately be benevolent and will do the right thing. And doing a lot of that education and reminding people that like this isn't new, um, that you know Google can say whatever it wants about supporting racial equity and creating task forces and committing to making all these changes. But then just last week, they um, allowed Steven Crowder, who was a, a conservative YouTube uh, content creator who was demonetized last year after harassing um, a queer immigrant person of color, was um, allowed to, like his channel was uh, allowed to sort of be on YouTube and use that platform to generate revenue. And one of his latest videos is literally entitled change my mind, Black Lives Matter is a domestic terrorist organization, you know, and I think that tells you enough about um, where the corporations had to really add, like, they'll, they'll say what's necessary to kind of make you feel like they're doing the right thing, but they'll never actually take actions that would affect their bottom line in any way. And so using those examples and really like having conversations and educating people about um, what's really happening and what like what mechanisms we can actually use to create change is I think a really important part of this. Yeah, I mean, to expand right on that, um, I'd be really curious to hear y'all's kind of thoughts on, you know, some kind of recent win or at least a positive development um, in your organizing efforts. And, and to Par's point, like, what were the things that actually built up to it? How'd you achieve it? Whether it's like the education that was required, the connection that was required between people or the tactics and strategies. Um, maybe Devin, do you want to start? All right. Um, I would say that our, our big victory recently was, uh, you know, reaching a successful, a positive resolution at the end of our strike. It is the first known successful strike in the games industry. Um, so, you know, we're very excited about that. Um, but also excited to be able to go back to work and to not all be fired. <laughs> So yeah, the, the process of getting there was definitely precarious, especially in all of our positions. Um, there was a lot of training we went through, um, you know, both provided by Code CWA and our own individual research, um, just about, you know, some things like how to talk to each other, how to organize um, within ourselves to kind of make sure that we had different departments doing different things. So no one person or group of people got overwhelmed. Um, definitely checking in with each other all the time. Uh, we set up a GoFundMe because the whole time we were striking, we would be without work. And the, the community and the fans and, and gamers were so supportive. So um, it was definitely a lot of the community that, that helped us get through that. Yeah, thanks, Devin. Sherry, how about yourself? Uh, so there are, there are a number of things, but I, um, I guess one of the recent successes um, I just want to premise this by saying that we're fighting Proposition 22, which is called the Protect App Based Drivers and Services Act, which is language that is just a sham of democracy and attempt to assure caste system for black and brown workers. Having said that, um, one of our successes in Oakland, worker voices were very central in, to, in convincing city council to pass an emergency um, sick leave ordinance. As it stands now, every full-time worker has 80 hours of sick pay uh, compensated should they contract um, COVID-19 um, so they can take time to get better without financial hardship 
and it slows the spread of the virus. And I want to be clear that if Prop 22 passes and retroactively kills these ordinances, like the one that's in Oakland, San Diego, Los Angeles, and um, San Francisco, um, so it's an important ballot um, measure that just that, that's just not for rideshare drivers, but ensures the health and well-being for everybody. So it's, it's an immoral imperative um, for me, and it was one of my uh, among one of my favorite um, campaigns. Can you expand on like um, the importance of seeing that fight as not just y'all, you know, the, the independent contractor workers, but also a thing that affects the community um, and what it's like to organize amongst the community as a part of your fight? I think, you know, um, it's really imperative that folks understand that when I say that um, to provide um, the safeguard and health and well-being of everyone, COVID-19 is not discriminatory. So I think that you need to explain that. And so what are the ways in which we can keep everybody safe? There are stories of drivers who lost their lives. Um, and Lyft and Uber were nowhere to be found. There are stories of drivers who continue to drive um, fear of financial ruin because there were no protections in place. And Lyft and Uber, again, were nowhere to be found and neither was their humanity. So I think it's important to understand what is the, what is the what is the benefit and what is the cost when you're organizing at the end of the day, asking yourself, what is the message? Um, what is the intended message that you're trying to get across when you're doing a campaign? In the areas of um, the pandemic that we see and in the other pandemic, racism is important that we educate um, those who are not aware of it. Um, and they can be, and it requires whether or not we're willing to put our bodies on the line, you know, whether or not we're willing to have campaigns that are non-arrestable um, to the point of increasing the attention um, in order to get um, increased awareness to whether or not we ask ourselves whether or not we're willing to be arrested. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Parl, what are your thoughts on a, you know, maybe a, a recent win or a positive development, at least in your organizing work and what brought you to that? Yeah, um, so I would love to share the story about um, the petition that we launched a couple of months ago. It's obviously a very different kind of campaign um, than you know the stories that Devin and Sherry shared, but um, maybe helpful to some. So around the start of um, you know the, the revolt that we saw in the streets um, against police brutality, a number of U.S. Um, workers at Google said that you know we should be responding to this movement in some way. And then we discovered that Google has contracts with uh, police departments and engages with them for in a variety of ways. And um, one of the contracts that it actually holds is with the police department in in Clarkstown, which is a town in New York State that had previously been sued by, um, on two separate occasions, by Black Lives Matter activists um, for racial profiling. And, um, you know, had this police department had shelled out basically hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in settlements for these cases. And they were displayed on uh, Google Cloud's advertising website as sort of like a, a model customer of, of, of G Suite, which is like the host of um, sort of office apps that Google sells. And, you know, we felt like ending a contract with, a, you know, not just a police department, um, but really like a, a, a police department with a problematic history of racial profiling uh, at a time when, you know, people are calling on us to defund the police was like a perfect way for us to well, not perfect, but some small way that we could respond to this movement, uh, to this movement in our own way. So we launched a petition calling on employees to sign and support and share. And we got 2000 Google workers to sign the petition. Um, you know, Google being sort of behemoth that it is led to a situation where um, the company hasn't sort of really clearly responded in any way to this petition. They have um, in other media outlets sort of 
continue to say that they will work with law enforcement. Um, so, you know, in that sense, maybe this petition didn't succeed, but what it did do is bring um, over a thousand workers together um, on a platform where they can now connect with each other and continue to build um, for other struggles. And we've, um, so we created this platform that, that is sort of internal and for Google workers to join after they sign this petition and we're using it to, um, you know, study together, we're hosting events with each other, we're like talking and learning about racism and, and doing anti-racist work together. Um, and there's a ton of potential in that space. So um, I think it's been a huge, uh, I think it's been a huge win for us and I'm really excited to see what comes of it. Awesome. And, you know, you're kind of talking about, you know, even just building that community with your fellow workers is a success, right? I think oftentimes, especially under capitalism, like people are, you know, forced into these isolated little wedges and boxes um, and taught to be a little bit alienated from one another. At least that's definitely my experience. Um, Devin, do you want to talk a little bit about like, um, you know, you have, I think, a very clear experience as independent contractors working for a company. You're kind of on the outside of the company in some ways. Um, and there's even some recent developments that even further accentuate some of the isolation management's trying to put you into. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and, and you know, how you relate that to organizing? Uh, for sure. Um, it's, you know, difficult at times to get your work done. Um, when you're remote, it's why companies generally want you to move to them and things like that. And they will generally only contract or outsource when they're trying to save costs. And so that means contractors are, are very much a second thought a lot of the time. Um, many, you know, across the gaming industry, across all industries, um, you know, there are very few transparency measures. Um, there are absolutely no protections under US labor law. You can just be let go without a reason. You're not, nobody's required to give you extra work. Um, in some contracts, you're not even allowed to work for anybody else if you take this job, even though it might not be full time, it might not pay you fairly. Um, and like Emma and, and Parwell were saying earlier, um, within contractors, you are more likely to find workers of color, workers who are queer, women and non-binary workers. Um, so it's, you know, very much those groups of people who are getting pushed to the bottom. So it's difficult to be kind of outside the company because then you can't advocate for yourself. You don't have a right to their HR department. There's nobody you can really talk to. So that's definitely part of it and why it's important for contractors to talk to each other. Yeah, and um, that also kind of, I feel like connects to Parl's experience as well. Parl, do you mind, you know, maybe talking about the importance of organizing, not just amongst the full-time workers at a place like Google, but also, you know, the TVCs and, and other forms of workers across the kind of large sprawling enterprise that is Google. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, I wish, I wish we had a, a, like a TVC from Google here to talk about that experience, but I could share what I've, um, not only like what I've understood of what that's like, um, which, you know, like Devin said, it's very similar to what Devin said. Um, you're not paid fairly at all. You're in many cases, you're paid much, much less than what like the average full-time employee at Google would make for doing, um, a similar sort of role. Um, you get like three days off a year. If you, if you get that at all, you don't have ability to sort of accrue vacation time. Um, you know, your health, uh, your healthcare options are, are very different or non-existent depending on who your contract is through. Um, I think for me, the important thing, and this is what I sort of like to explain to other full-time employees is that like, the, the reality and the nature of like contact, contract work and how precarious it is, is by design. Like that's just how capitalism functions. Um, and more and more workers are being pushed into roles like that or being pushed into the gig economy um, at higher rates. Um, and the, the importance of solidarity is like, it comes from knowing that if Google wanted to, or as soon as it's actually able to, it's going to try to slash its full-time contract 
for workforce and trying to make us contractors as well. It's just, that's just how it works. They're always trying to find ways to like pay people less and get more out of them. Um, and I, I think the data shows it as well. The rates of contractization and the rates of people being pushed into gig work and freelance work has gone up over the last decade. Um, and this, this trend is slated to sort of continue until, um, you know, less and less people enjoy the kind of salary and benefits that full-time employees get. Um, so that's, that's what I always tell other uh, full-time employees. Like they, they would treat you like this if they could. Right now, the, the market rate and the, the demand for certain kinds of talent um, creates a situation where they have to pay you like a six-figure salary and give you good health insurance or something like that. But as soon as that's, as soon as that's gone and that, you know, that will happen as, as automation and as like tools that you use to do your job improve, um, more and more of us are going to be pushed into those precarious situations. Um, and that's why it's really important that we have solidarity with each other right now. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, and, you know, like Devin reiterated, contract workers tend to be people of color, women, and folks who are marginalized in, like, many different ways. And if, if we claim to be serious about doing anti-racist work, then we have to address the working conditions of the most marginalized people at our workplaces who tend to be TVCs. Yeah, and I feel like that's definitely something that is connected to all three of your organizing efforts, right? I think, Devin, your organizing is very related to the different forms of marginalization amongst your coworkers. And, you know, that's also why you're hired as the writers you are, because you're writing, you know, stories that are reflective of a more diverse audience. Um, and, and Sherry, I, you know, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about, you know, continuing this thread, like how are workers fighting back against good companies that exploit black and brown folks in particular? And like, what are some real big takeaways that I think everyone could learn from that experience? I totally agree with Peru, what Peru said. Um, it's about being in solidarity. Um, and it's to um, understand um, in the area of gig workers that essential workers are essential, then we need to let, then we need to begin to start treating them as such. A, a University of Santa Cruz study that over 70% of the ride share drivers are black and brown and 50% of them are immigrants. So I'm let you, I want folks to let that sink in for a moment. How is it that those who have no voices and no protections in place always the ones with less protections and less pay? And right now um, in California, you know, um, Lyft and Uber are spending tons of money massive corporate spending, petition signatures. They're producing ads with ads in social media that I call professional lies, um, ensure that their empire is protected. Uh, and so there's heavy corporate influence in action to distort the narrative around protections for basic, ordinary people. They're spending over $110 million to do that. One of the most expensive ballot measures that California has seen. It's to protect um, a system that's in place, a system that has refused to listen to the pleas and agitations brought around by people who look like me. And it's important, it's important, um, as Farouk said, to be in solidarity. It's this moment for us to come together and take care of those who are mostly impacted. And we have that opportunity. Um, between now and November, probably about 80 days, um, listen to the real experts, the rideshare drivers. I'm urging folks to say no on Prop 22 because the implications are too great not to. But yeah. Thank you, Sherry. And yeah, it's kind of mind boggling if you learn about the, just the massive amount of <laughs> corporate wealth being poured into essentially trying to undermine, you know, workers' rights, um, particularly aimed at the lowest wage folks, um, you know, I, I know of. Um, and I, I think people tend to not realize just how comprehensive the repression of all forms of workers are. And, and like Parl said, it doesn't matter even if you're a full-time Google worker. They're, you know, they are trying to find ways where they can, you know, trim down their expenses and raise their bottom line, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we got a really good question from someone in the audience. Um, they ask, you kind of related to this, what do you think are the largest hurdles keeping non-represented tech and game workers and gig workers 
from seeking representation from unions and building their own voice and power. Do one of you maybe want to answer that? You can go there. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, um, Devin. Yeah, as a game worker, I think uh, part of it is definitely just a lack of knowledge of who will or can support you. The game industry is still not organized generally, and the, the Code CWA initiative, that just started this year, right? Um, so, so Val was kind of lucky in that regard, that this was the time that we came together and there was someone who, who kind of knew the industry and what we were going through and how to help, um, because you know six months ago, we would not have had that option, uh, as far as we know. Um, so I think it's just important to keep getting the word out and to make sure people know that there are resources um, and that even if, if like real official legal representation is not possible, it's not the same thing as support not being possible. There are people who will support you. Yeah, um, we need to wind down now, but um, uh, you know, I, I really wish I could hear all three of you answer that question in particular and, and talk so much more about these subjects. Um, but we do have to wrap up, unfortunately, for time. Um, so I just want to thank the three of you so much for participating in this panel. And, um, uh, you know, I also want to note that, you know, we're going to have a Zoom call uh, after this session for folks who are attendees. Um, you can hop into that. You should be able to find the link in the chat here. Um, and if you want to continue that discussion or connect um, more about what organizing might look like in your workplace or industry, um, hop into that chat or reach out to any of us um, and we'd be love, we'd love to just like talk with you about organizing. But yeah, thank you all for attending and hopefully have a good rest of your sessions. We're heading on to the other room, I suppose. <laughs>